a team of demolition experts is about to pull the trigger on its latest target. But this 6,000 ton rocket launch tower is built to withstand hurricanes. Not ready to cry. Lightning. It's getting real emotional. It's getting real close. And the inferno of a rocket engine. Everybody's getting a little bit uptight. The clock is ticking. It's the science of rocketry versus the art. Okay, here we go, Stacy. Of demolition. Four, three, two, one. Florida, USA. Cape Canaveral, the heart of America's space program. The Patrick Air Force Base has been sending rockets into space for over 40 years. But after 55 missions, launch tower MST-40 has been declared obsolete. To take it down, the Air Force have brought in Control Demolition Incorporated, a family business from Maryland, USA. They're one of the best in the world. In the you way figure it out. But this is one of the toughest jobs they've ever been assigned by the Air Force. Launch towers are built to withstand enormous heat and pressure. Their metal frames are immune to normal dynamite. And CDI have just 31 days to make sure this giant will fall. Company president and lead designer Marc Loiseau moves in to inspect the target. When it was built, MST-40 was the largest mobile structure in the world. It's 26 levels standing over 90 meters high. It's surrounded by four massive lightning towers, and below it, a control room called the Bat Cave. During the tower's destruction, both the lightning towers and the Bat Cave must be preserved. Unlike other structures that Mark has imploded, MST-40 is unique in design and strength, requiring an unusual demolition plan. When we walk around the structure, you'll see that we have a lot more structural weight and, and a lot more structural capability on the north side than we do the south. Mark's demolition strategy looks something like this. From a single trigger point, he'll ignite a charge that travels through two lines at over 15,000 miles per hour. The charge will ignite explosives loaded into the front of the first five levels. The tower should begin to fall. Then a second set of explosives will detonate on the seventh level, creating a notch for the weakened tower to fall around. But there's a catch. The tower sits over the bat cave. If the tower comes down as planned, the weight will collapse the bat cave and destroy it. For a successful demolition, Mark's team will have to relocate the tower. Project manager Kevin Klass has the job of moving the 6,000-ton tower to the end of the launch pad's runway. The tower does have wheels, but there's a problem. No one has used them in three years, and they've totally seized up. It isn't the first time CDI has faced a demanding challenge at the Patrick Air Force Base. MST-40's demolition is just part of NASA's long-term plan to retire old launch sites and create room for new ones that may one day send civilians into outer space. In 2005, CDI destroyed the 55-meter-high launch tower 13. In 2007, they went one better, imploding two towers in one day. First, Complex 36A. Four
followed ten minutes later by Complex 36B. But MST-40 presents CDI with their biggest challenge yet. At over 90 meters, it's nearly 40 meters taller than Complex 36. And before they can even start to lay explosives, they have to move the tower over 20 meters to the end of the runway. At one time, hydraulic motors held the tower up. But now, without power, MST-40 has sagged down onto resting blocks, seizing the wheels in place. Without releasing them, the 6,000-ton tower isn't moving anywhere, and the project won't be getting out of the starting blocks. What we have to do in order for us to be able to move the MST is whittle away some of the top of those stops so it'll rest back down on its wheels. We're doing what the hydraulic motors used to do, but we're doing it with a torch. While the crew cuts the wheels free, the team have another problem. Even if they succeed in getting the tower to move, they still have to work out how to stop it before it hits the end of the runway. At Cape Canaveral, the demolition team are faced with a major problem. How to move a 6,000-ton rocket tower that hasn't moved anywhere for three years? And even if they get it to move, without brakes, how do they get it to stop? Put two machines out front with these two-inch lines to the north. We have two machines tethered to the back just to make sure we can slow it down, if you can, uh, to move it real slowly and get it into position. But even with the four 1,500 horsepower excavators pulling and pushing the tower, the team can't be sure their plan will work. They attach two-inch-thick steel cables and fire up the engines. If the tower doesn't move, the whole demolition project will be over before it's even started. For the first time in three and a half years, the tower's wheels begin to roll. It builds up speed and rapidly approaches the end of the runway. Keep going. Slow down. The team now have to stop the machine before it plummets over the edge. With two excavators pulling on the chains, MST-40 comes to a halt with only centimeters to spare. If that was like you just got 13.2 million pounds off your shoulders. With the tower now at a safe distance from the Batcave, Kevin and lead designer Mark Roiseau can now prepare it for demolition. Now, talk to me it's a mass of interconnected steel. Mark's worried that unless it's weakened, it'll put the demolition in jeopardy. Every column on this level needs to get cut. The diagonals at this level need to be separated not at both ends, just there's got to be a separation. So in your mind, you're drawing a line through the sh all structural members here so the whole top can roll off. The higher they go, the worse the situation becomes. The structure's far stronger than they expected. The demolition team will have to remove almost 2,000 tons of steel from MST-40, a third of its entire weight. All of these things that you see that are that are standing vertically and horizontally. It's, it's the, we, we don't like stickers in this business. They seem to, they'll, they'll, they'll stop inertia. And uh, it's just the finest thing that'll hold something up from moving. And as you can see, right now, it's the sum of a lot of parts. They now have only 28 days to gut the tower before it's demolished. Every piece of conduit. Everything, every hydraulic line, every fire line must come out on the floors where we are moving it. Kevin and the team set to work. The first job is to attack the aluminium sides of the tower. 
Only then can they get to grips with the insides. If I could just pop a two holes and cable it and rip the whole wall right out, I mean, it, that saved me a lot of time. There's a lot that needs to go, including delicate electronic systems housed in heavy-duty cabinets. Holy mackerel. I guess this is why I don't build anything. Well. What can't be ripped out has to be burnt off with cutting torches. But at Cape Canaveral, even that isn't straightforward. For two years, the region suffered from severe drought, and the grasslands around Florida's space coast are tinder dry. With fires already breaking out on the horizon and a constant ocean breeze blowing in, Kevin knows the team cannot take any risks. Even in the cool of evening, fire is a constant hazard. When you're cutting on the steel, the embers and the sparks, 18 mile an hour wind takes the sparks out into the, the grass here. I got a, now I got a grass fire to contend with. It's not just the grasslands that are a concern. The team also have to worry about igniting now vulnerable materials within the tower. Anything that's cut with a torch is a fire hazard and has to be hosed down immediately. But even with over half a mile of hose pipe, the embers are still proving a problem. Kevin has to refine his plan. If you use a torch on conduit, it has wire in it, it's gonna start a fire. To prevent that, what we're gonna use blue being cold cut, red being hot cut with a torch. Each and every cutting point on all 26 levels has to be marked up. And in place of a torch, Kevin supplies the team with a less flammable tool, called a demo saw. The saw's blade rotates 9,300 times per minute, but its resin fiber blade creates fewer sparks than the torches. You know, it, it, it cuts through pretty much everything. It just cuts through rubber and everything that we can't cut with a torch. The saw solves the fire problem. But weighing in at over nine kilos, it creates another. You make a couple cuts up above your head, or sometimes we gotta go sideways. That really puts a lot of strain on you. The team has already removed hundreds of kilograms of metal and pipes, taking apart a tower that, when it was built, was a marvel of the engineering world. In the Cold War race to beat Soviet aerospace technology, the US Air Force combined its weapons and space programs, adapting intercontinental missiles to carry strategic satellites instead of nuclear warheads. These missiles became known as Titan rockets. Of the 368 that were launched, 55 were from Complex 40. By the early 1990s, the 80-meter tall launch tower was a rolling rocket repair workshop and launch pad housing complex diagnostic computers and lifts that took scientists into the very heart of the rocket. In 1992, MST-40 launched the Mars Observer rocket. Five years later, the tower sent the Cassini mission to Saturn. But by the late 1990s, the Air Force had begun phasing out the Titan rockets, and in 2005, MST-40 was finally retired. 
Today, everything that made the rocket tower a miracle of aerospace technology is now an obstacle for the demolition team. Once critical to the tower's operations, the service lifts are now a liability. Each weighs nearly one and a half tons and sits in the corners of the U-shaped tower, blocking the team's access to the steel frame, where explosives must be loaded. They must be removed. While the rest of the crew continue to gunk the tower, Kevin dispatches longtime employee Victor Zuniga to take care of the lifts. Victor climbs in and burns the motor off the first lift. He then cuts the cables, releasing the counterweights. He burns off the brakes and with one final cut, the lift crashes to the ground. At the other lift, Victor tries to do the same. But halfway down the shaft, it gets stuck. Despite hours of cutting, Victor can't release it. There's only one way to get it out. They have to rip it out. The team completes the job, but removing the lifts has taken two days, putting them behind schedule. And just when they think they can start to make progress, another setback looks likely to hit the demolition team. This is hurricane country, and rocket tower MST-40 is in the path of a major storm. With 22 days to the demolition of rocket tower MST-40, project manager Kevin Klass has a problem. Overnight, high winds have pushed the tower to the end of the runway, crushing its edge. A few centimeters further, and the entire structure would have toppled over. The crew pull the tower back using excavators and chain it to blocks on the runway. With one problem fixed, they immediately face another. The protective lightning towers. Florida is America's lightning capital, with an average of 100 days of electrical storms each year. Cape Canaveral sits in an area nicknamed Lightning Alley. Every square mile sees over 80 lightning strikes each year. To protect the launch tower, MST-40 was surrounded by four giant lightning towers. Steel guy wires tied to concrete anchors helped stabilize them. But despite moving the tower to the edge of the runway, two of the lightning towers and their guy wires are within range of the tower when it's demolished. The team are worried that flying debris could snap a guy wire, releasing nearly three tons of tension and toppling the lightning towers. Well, I look up and I see ductwork, I see pipes that are running up the outside of that corner there. Out. If it comes down and hits and releases, it's all moving this way. Do I think that these are in jeopardy right now? Mark makes a decision. From a risk management standpoint, given the criticality of these and, and the consequences of damaging it, a sudden release, it's not worth the risk. No, I, I the guy wires must be moved. Mark enlists the help of Lightning Tower expert David Stiles. The engineer's done the math, now it's time to go look. David climbs over a hundred meters up the tower to determine where the anchor points need to be. We're on the top, David, we can see you. 
For a high-tech job, he uses a basic form of measurement. Yeah, I'd say it's at least five feet, so I think we're good. Yeah, it's the best case scenario. Everything is perfect. Once it's repositioned on the mast, the cable can reach its new, safe location on the ground. So we're going to remove the guy wires, keep tension on them, and move them toward the back of the structure to the south temporarily until the structure's on the ground. David will need to move the guy wires over 30 meters away from the tower. X marks the spot. But before the cables can be moved, the team must finish gutting the launch tower. And 20 mile per hour winds are whipping through the stripped down structure making the tower dangerous for the crew. As a precaution, everyone must wear a special harness known as a yo-yo. It's a safety harness. If you fall, it protects you. It saves your life. It's a yo-yo. What it is, if it goes too fast, it stops immediately. You get a nice, fast jerk. Harnessed up, the team can start work on the next big step removing the tower's computer consoles and heavy-duty electrical panels. The consoles are so strong that, if left in place, they could alter the tower's collapse. That's right in the way of our major motion floor. Basically, like, from level one to level three, that whole section is being kicked out. Removing the consoles by hand could take a long time, but Kevin has a shortcut. They attach one end of a cable to the consoles and the other end to an excavator and rip them out. The crew can now finally clear the rest of the tower interior. But there's no time to rest. The explosives will be arriving soon, and before that, they need to strategically weaken the metal frame. It actually takes about 1,500 degrees to melt. Only one tool can cut through the steel beams, a propane and oxygen cutting torch. There we go. You have to adjust it. Tip of the torch shows you the custom blue flame on it. That's what actually melts the steel. Your oxygen trigger actually blows the steel away. This is what we call, typically in, in layman's terms, a box cut. We cut through the web, and this will free up the column once we cut it with our linear shape charges. These are precision cuts. These need to be cut on 45 degree angle so that the linear shape charge can be placed with inside the, the flange of this column. The team also has to slice through whole sections of metal to ensure the tower falls to plan. The purpose of this angle is so that once this member is cut with the linear shape charge, it's free to move. If these angles were still in place, it might get stuck on this gusset. So right now, once this is cut, this can go anywhere. But the team works carefully. Burning in the wrong place could destabilize the whole tower. Try not to heat this up. You see, you hit it right there. Try not to heat it up, dude, please. I mean, you don't have to get real close to it. Just take it up to right here. Well, okay, let's make sure we got room to put the no. shape in there. No, 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 no. Do not heat this up, please. I'll snap on you. On this weakened structure, a wrong cut could injure or even kill someone. They make progress. A hundred box cuts in 18 hours. Only 80 more to go. But three weeks of non-stop stressful work is beginning to wear the team down. I know you've walked this building a million times but it's weird now, the way things are all tied together. And I, I don't know what they do. Kevin, because he's responsible for it, is maybe under more pressure than, than some of the other folks here. But he's solid. He's solid. He can handle it. 
Every time we take something off, she barks at us, so. Uh, Miss Strong and Tough is just not cooperating as, as much as I'd like. With the steel cuts nearing completion, the team now have to remove another part of the tower, the floors. If they were left in place, during demolition, the floors could trap falling beams and hold the structure up. So the team needs to cut the floors out from beneath their feet. Leaving them with little access to stairwells and only the narrow remaining girders to move around on. The floors also served another purpose, helping to stabilize the launch tower from high winds. Once they're gone, the team will have to work around the weather or risk being blown from the tower. It's still all about the wind. We're watching the weather now. We've got hourly forecasts up through Thursday. So we keep watching the wind and we're also watching the longer term uh, potential for tropical storms. You have to be aware of it. Rocket Tower MST-40 becomes more treacherous with every day. It does get a little eerie looking and a little eerie feeling. Uh, I've started to name her instead of MST, now she's Miss Strong and Tough, so she's getting meaner, that's for sure. It's two days before demolition. The team can now move the guy wires on the lightning towers. One worker climbs the tower to move the cable on the mast. Another starts to loosen the cable anchor on the ground. Working together, they release the tension, causing the tower to become unstable. We're gonna try to pull in the first temporary guy wire and maybe get it tensioned up. The towers are now vulnerable to the winds and could collapse. The team quickly anchors the wires into their new temporary location. No one can be sure they'll hold once tension is reapplied. Slowly, they increase the tension on the lines to nearly three tons. Both wires hold. But in the tower, there's still much to do. The crew works long into the night to have everything ready for the arrival of the explosives. After a month of gutting and preparation, Rocket Tower MST-40 is nearing the end of its life. The plan is now finally coming together. All right, so that piece right here, this column, mm -hmm. which is the three, four. The tower is now standing at the end of the runway over a five meter drop. Mark wants to use the tower's natural weight to fall over this precipice away from the lightning towers and bat cave. To start the fall, he'll notch the tower like a tree by detonating charges on the bottom three floors, slicing through the steel support columns and beams and causing the tower to collapse towards the notch. The structure is massive. It's really heavy. If it moves, it stops, and it sits down vertically, we have a problem. It's got to move quickly. It's got to keep moving. To keep the tower falling, Mark will detonate a second series of explosives, shearing off the seventh level. The top of the tower will now be free to fall forward, giving the momentum to carry it over the edge of the runway. The explosives are arriving on site. The plan can now be put into action. Mark's daughter, Stacy, has brought powerful charges that can cut through even MST-40's rocket-proof steel. Go. 
They're called linear-shaped charges. And the Air Force has deemed them so volatile and dangerous that only essential crew are allowed within 350 meters of them. CDI veteran Ray Zukowski is one of them. It's named that uh, specifically because of the shape of the charge. What you see here is a, a copper coating, and inside is a um, explosive called RDX. It's, it's a form of a plastic explosive, detonates at about 25,000 feet per second. It's very fast, very high velocity. And they meet in the middle, and then they get pushed down through the target. The team will need over 700 of these charges to bring the rocket tower down, but the charge itself is just one part of a more complex system. This is what we call a pigtail assembly. This is a combination of 80 grain detonating cord, and this actually has an explosive powder inside of it called PETN. It is connected to an RDX booster. RDX is another type of explosive. This piece of wood is simply there to give us something to affix to the end of the shape charge so that we get a nice firm budding of the cap up against the powder inside the linear shape charge. Each explosive must be assembled by hand. Once fitted with a detonating cap, they'll be ready to blow. That detonating cap is extremely sensitive to impact. It will detonate if, if you tromp on it, drop something on it. Uh, you have to watch those very carefully. The team fans out across the structure, planting the shaped charges at strategic points. Once exploded, their effect on steel will be devastating. Only the inside of the V-shaped charge is coated with high explosives. The V shapes the charge into a sharp point. If the shape charge is placed against the element like this, these little rubber feet you see right here, these keep the shape charge the precise distance from the material you want to cut. What that does is that gives it time for the jet to literally form. It's called the Monroe effect. By placing the explosives a small distance away from the steel, the explosive power emitted from either side of the V comes together. The precise moment they meet on the steel is when the charge is at its strongest. This will speed up to 27,000 feet per second detonation, creating an incredible amount of pressure on this steel, literally cutting through it like a knife. 25 days of hard-won groundwork begin to pay off. The explosives team put Kevin's 180 box cuts to good use. By putting this little box in here, obviously we're allowing a place to put the shape through the web of the column. This little V here it gives it a place to slide off. That's all it does. And by, by putting them on at this diagonal, we're trying to fill this structure in this direction. By creating this diagonal, we're making it easier for the top of this to slide off the bottom. It's a simple and effective way to get gravity working in their favor. In every single project that we do, explosives are nothing more than a catalyst. Our number one tool is gravity. That's what we're doing here. The explosives team must cut the fuse on each shaped charge exactly the same length to ensure that the explosives detonate simultaneously. The slightest error could create a botched demolition. Otherwise, what happens, this one goes off 10 milliseconds before the other, it will knock that one off without detonating it. Now we've got a live shape charge in the pile, which is absolutely unacceptable. An unexploded charge in the tower's debris could detonate during cleanup of the demolished tower. Stacy and Ray need to load the 11th and 7th levels. But with much of the flooring removed, access is proving a challenge. The whole three row, you gotta tie off and you gotta walk the steel, there's no way to get to it. With the catwalks and access corridors gone, Stacy's forced to the edge of the tower's infrastructure. It's slow work. There are now only two days left until demolition and hundreds of shaped charges still to be loaded. With the pressure mounting, everybody has to help load the tower, strapping explosives to MST-40's exterior legs using man lifts. Even company president, Marc Roiseau, jumps in to help. The team knows that loading the explosives is only half the job. They must also contain the shaped charge's deadly force. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. For every bit of force that is sending energy through this steel, this jacket is flying off the other way with the same amount of force. 
The jackets could project backwards at over five miles per second into a crowd of military observers. So by putting it on the inside of this H shape, we're actually, all the copper is going to do is hit the other side. It's not going to go zinging. The crew also wraps thick material around the charges to contain debris. After four days of endless loading, wiring and covering, the tower's finally ready. Controlled Demolition Incorporated has stripped down a rocket launch tower and turned it into a skeletal shell of its former self. In the morning, the crew will learn if their painstaking preparations are enough to bring the tower safely down. At Rocket Tower MST-40, Demolition Day has finally arrived. It's getting real emotional. It's getting real close, so... Uh, kind of gonna miss her, but she's kind of been a real big pain. So, I don't know. I guess it's kind of like anything. You know, just, the more you love them, the more you gotta hate them. Ray, Stacy, and Kevin spread out across the tower doing last-minute checks. Each detonation cord connection and explosive placement must be inspected. Straight away, Stacy finds a mistake. One of the explosives is not connected to the implosion sequence. You can actually see it from here. The problem is fixed, and the rest of the explosives triple checked. Walking again for the 50th time. Everything looks good. The demolition team can begin the final preparations. The detonation cord is connected to the initiation box. Kevin will trigger the tower's implosion from a shelter 300 meters away. It's now 10 minutes to demolition. The media have lined up along the security perimeter. Air Force Base security sets up an exclusion zone. The number one thing here is public safety and anybody that is not directly involved with the operation is public. So what we do is we establish boundaries and maintain them. Kevin takes up his position. The tower is a trigger pull away from annihilation. All right, we're hooked up. OK, here we go, Stacy. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. While the team waits for the dust to settle, they review their work on high-speed cameras. The explosive pulse travels up the detonating cord. The lower floors are hit first. Explosions speed across the columns, cutting them, creating the notch. A shower of black rubber spins outward. These are the fragments of the conveyor belting that help contain the shape charges debris. MST-40 begins to roll forward. The explosive charge continues to move up the cord. It reaches the shape charges on the seventh level. The upper floors are sheared clean off, accelerating the tower's forward motion.
real slow so we can see. Yeah, for us. Incredible. This demolition family has never before seen their handiwork played out so vividly. Oh, oh my God. That's amazing. Look at that. Look at, Look at that. Back up one. Look at this the one color. Bit. To most people, something burning at 21 or 22,000 feet per second or 23 feet per millisecond, per thousandth of a second, that's instantaneous. But with the high speed videography, you can literally watch the progression of the charges. This is far and away the most robust and heaviest structure uh, that we've taken down here at the Cape. The team moves in to see the results of their handiwork. This is all penetration. I can see right here, these two little lines are where we had a zip tie around the standoff. It modifies the jet a little bit. By analyzing the demolished structure, the team can better understand the effects of different explosives on different materials. This is when we learn about projects afterwards and, and what we learn after this shot, we'll put to work on the next one. These demolition experts can now better predict the exact amount of explosives needed on future steel projects. The bat cave is safe. The lightning towers are untouched. The tower is exactly where they want it. It's mission accomplished. In the contest of rocket science versus the art of demolition, Mark and his team have come out on top. Jean-Claude's a pretty bad-tempered war veteran next, but he doesn't deserve to get beaten up, and when he does, he wants revenge, obviously. The Seagal vs. Van Damme season continues with Inferno.